Hello viewers and welcome back to Gary Grigsby's War in the East once again. I'm your host, Pupichu Chu, and welcome back to our, well, I don't know whether or not this is a series or just kind of a temporary thing, but anyhow, today we're back with another scenario inside the game. We're revisiting um, another one of the ones that I do believe I have published before, and the reason being is that, and again, I think this is a really nice thing to show the people coming here from Steam, um, the one of the, the kind of moderate uh, scenarios inside the game, just in general, what you're what you're typically looking at uh, or you know dealing with inside this uh, title. So um, last time in the road to Leningrad, and if you haven't watched that, I encourage you to check that out. We we dealt with the with the war in the northern portion of the map, the push from um, over here to Riga to Leningrad, and I think that's a nice video for for people who who are, who came to this one who haven't watched those to check them out because there I go through some of the basics of the gameplay. Today we're going to go into, I wouldn't say anything more in terms of just abstract concepts, but more so say some of the applications of that. And with that said, today we're playing another uh, very, very early in the war scenario. It is, uh, well, the 6th of, or, to, or June 26, 20, 22nd, sorry, of 1941 once again. And we are tasked with uh, the center of the front here, and our objectives is to push, ideally to Smolensk, uh, but the game gives us a few other objectives along the way here, and aptly the scenario is named The Road to Smolensk. So, one thing that I should note, uh, the game gives us the objectives of Moscow over here, and a few other ones to take. Um, one of the things is that if the game gives you objectives, it, it's not the game designer telling you you should kind of be able to take all of these, it's you gotta make a choice whether or not you want to take this one or the other one. In fact, in this scenario, I mean, if you really wanted to, I think if you take Moscow, because it grants a thousand points, right? Uh, that's that's like, yeah, that's worth five times over um, some of these other ones. So with that said, I mean, it, it plays into a thing, but bear in mind that... Um, it's, it's a historical game, right? So it's fairly difficult to achieve those things. So uh, we're playing this Germans once again, and the reason being is that early on in the war, um, the Germans are fairly easy to play. And well, here we can learn a little bit about just generally how the combat kind of flows. Um, going from some of the basic gameplay concepts we've seen uh, once before. So let's begin. I, um, so starting things off, this, at the very start of the war, the Germans, of course, get this uh, bonus to their attack. Um, and with that said, we're going to use that surprise and we're going to bombard some airfields right off the bat. So the thing with this is that um, let's see if we can let's see if we have any uh, airfield notifications here. If we know exactly how many planes on the ground, that would be better. But it doesn't look like we do. So in that case, we'll just go through to the bombing. Right, so ooh, would you look at that? We managed to pick off 125 fighters right over there, so this is very, very good. But in general, I'm not going to cover the air war too much, more or less, because in, in my opinion, the mechanics are a little bit weird or foreign to me. So we'll go with it. The idea, again, being is that uh, the game kind of calculates the strengths of each plane and more importantly, how long they can fly. So uh, going from those stats, you you get a rough picture of how well they can, they can kind of bomb things. And with that said, we just kind of send them in. They do their thing. And uh, the game kind of goes from there. Right. So I believe that is all of our air forces so far. And, well, I'll try to pull up the documents that say exactly how much of a, of a bonus you get per early game attack. But showing you guys the combat over here, uh, taking a look at the details, the Russians lost two or more than, yeah, it looks like 125 fighters, nearly 50 bombers here, um, 100 fighters here, nearly 50 bombers again here. Didn't lose too much over here because we only have 10 bombers left at this point. Uh, but over here, they lost 50 fighters, and over here, they lost 41. So, nevertheless, I mean, one of the things is that you 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 can you can try to min maximize exactly you know how much damage you're doing and how much stuff you're doing there um, for that maximum effect and of course that helps you out inside this grand campaign type of thing. So taking a look at the losses, we lost a few you know minor bombers, two fight or one fighter actually, um, and mind you the the Russians took a lot of permanent losses. So um, if we remember from earlier your units they they can be permanent losses where can they they can just be merely damaged hopefully what we can do here is that we can get the panzers to roll through and clear up those airfields because um it damaged if they uh, if they try to kind of move those damaged units from away from us uh they're automatically destroyed and with that said that would help us out quite a bit early on inside the game 
So once again, we are tasked with kind of pushing through the Russian front and uh, ideally destroying as many units as possible. So you have a choice here. You can try to eliminate units on the field, or you can try to clear them along the uh, or along the way here. Um, so going off those two options, you might say want to destroy a large pocket of enemy troops early on inside the game, and then later on, uh, because there's of course a huge gap in the enemy's kind of lines now, um, especially in manpower just alone, you you can kind of transition that into a into a bit of a moderate uh, advantage over time. I wouldn't say it's a long term advantage because the Soviets get those troops back eventually, but it does hold up the fort. So, um, starting on the field here, as you may have noticed, our tanks are on the very sides of the flanks and the middle is just mostly infantry. So, this serves for a very select purpose. We want to press into here and we want to ideally cr make a pocket, surround a whole bunch of, of Russian troops and just kind of crush them so that they don't reform later on. So, we'll try our best to do that. And in the meantime, one of the things that I wanted to bring over here, and again, I want to start from one side of the map, and I kind of want to move to the other one, is the Fort of Brest Lutovsk over here. This is a this is a pretty strong location for the Russians, so I'm going to use the deliberate attack right away. Um, at the very start of the war, the Germans couldn't take that area very easily, as a matter of fact, and they, they spent quite some time... Um, being being kind of held back i think they i think they managed to hold up for more than a few weeks in fact so anyhow we'll we'll get our forces to push through here and the idea being again the infantry make a gap through the enemy lines and then you get the rest of the forces to stream through so now you get a question i mean how how far do you want to kind of move with your forces and with that said we want to do this kind of gradually so firstly um we're just about to push into an airfield i believe where i think we already moved Move that one but anyhow um, when we move these airfields they should show up with even more losses now my plan is I think we'll move like this and the idea is that I want to try to make it very very difficult for the uh, for for the for the pocketed troops over here to escape and with that said right now I'm thinking do I want to divide my troops or do I want to kind of keep them um, as one big thing, if that makes any sense, which it probably doesn't. The idea being that as you move through these, uh, you know, slightly reddened tiles, this is enemy territory. It costs an additional movement point to move through it. So, with that said, right now I'm trying to, I'm trying to have a very low amount of redundancy along the front here. I'm using up a lot of my movement points for my infantry corps over here. And as they do, they're surrounding this area, but I don't necessarily want to stack them up as any more than I need them to. So I get the slower units again to clear the way. Uh, ideally, these bigger divisions, um, they clear out the enemy hex, the enemy kind of um, enemy territory effect, all of the way through around their their unit and every yeah and all the adjacent tiles, which is quite useful. Whereas if I split them into you know three smaller units, uh, they would be less so effective at clearing areas all around them, but they would cover a lot more space. Is the uh, the trade off there? So, for example, over here, I might decide to split this troop up, but it doesn't look like it can move um, any more behind that. So, you know what? I think I'll just press forwards here, try to move back the enemy tanks um, stationed over there to grab some more um, some more combat power like that. I'll move along the front here with some infantry. And over here, these are uh, these are swamp areas, so these are these are kind of difficult to handle. I, I move one troop forward. The reason being is that you know what uh, I can move both of these forwards. I wanted to clear out this area. The reason being was that Brest Luktovsk over here is uh, is the start of the railway network into their territory, and I would like to keep that open. So we'll do something like that. Right. So afterwards, um, now my me my 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 methodology here is that I want to keep the forces in the back moving first and then I kind of want to move everything else so that I can um, so that I can kind of maximize the amount of territory I get at the very start of the game and kind of work my way forwards from there and another thing is that as we've seen inside the past episode, I mean, you can use these railway battalions to 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 kind of convert the uh, the, the Soviet railway system to to something that um, that that's more fitting to the to the German uh, trains. Uh, but 
last time inside the north here, the speciality over here being that it only costs you one movement points uh, to do that. These field battalions, they have 16, as you see here. But inside the center and southern ports of the map, in, in fact, the majority por portions of the map, um, it costs you three points instead. So with that said, these areas are a little bit more difficult to convert. And with that said... I mean, as we see here, we only advance about uh, 20 miles or, yeah, 20 miles, so 20, like, uh, 20, 20 or 2 tiles. So it's not that much, but nevertheless, it's a, it's a very vital portion of the game that you just kind of have to deal with. So moving forwards from there, let's get the HQs set up and we'll move the air HQ and the, uh, the adjacent airfield forwards and then we'll get the, the rest of the tanks moving. So, talking a little bit about the supply chain again, because it is very, very vital, especially uh, early on, because, you know, it, it the, the effects of supply kind of accumulate. If you don't deal with it early on, it'll get gradually worse and worse. Um, what we have here is titled a motor pool um, up inside the corner here. So, currently we have about, you know, 113,000 vehicles as our, at our disposal, and that 0,000 in brackets, um, that is the amount of vehicles needed for, the, for supply to, to fully function. So um, inside the game, how it works is that vehicles such as like, you know, trucks, horses, wagons, just in general, anything carrying supplies is modeled using this system. The idea being that when you move HQs and when you move units in general, you need things to carry all of the crap that they kind of lug around. That is especially relevant with uh, things such as airfields and HQs. So with that said, the more you kind of move those units, the more motor pool units you, you kind of um, need to, to have around. So with that said, um, it makes it makes for quite a big difference in how far you can really kind of push up your supply network at one time. Um, one of the critical things I wanted to note here is these supply dumps that your units can build. So these supply dumps and fuel dumps, they are actually units containing exactly one unit of fuel or one unit of supply. Uh, they're technically tons. We're just going to go with generic units for now. Uh, but the thing is that the, you, you can carry excess supplies in your HQs, and I would assume your units, though I've never, I don't believe I've seen it happen. Um, the only problem with it is that it takes, I believe, one unit, uh, or I think a, I, I think it takes an arbitrary amount of vehicles to A, form that supply pool, but B, in addition to that, um, when you move these kind of bulky stockpiled HQs, they coincidentally also are, are, quite, uh, are quite bulky to move around, which will take away things from your motor pool. Um, the reason why I bring this up is that later on, as we'll see, uh, your supply, your motor pool isn't uh, well. It's it's not it's not that um, it's not that big of a thing, despite having so many vehicles. It's actually quite fragile. So, with that said, um, one of the things that we might want to do here is really rather conserve, uh, you know, how far we're kind of moving those HQs as we go along. Right, so over here, I'm gonna get the tanks to stream forwards. I'm gonna get them to make a river crossing here. And right now, I'm, I'm gonna do something that I haven't tried before, but I'm gonna trade a lot of space for a lot of uh, time, if that makes any any sense. The idea being is that I'm, I'm, I'm getting a lot of units over here to kind of man the the, the, uh, the defense, or the, the, the not the defense, but the, the pocketing of these guys rather than kind of committing a lot of troops to actually attacking so we'll do that here and the idea being that uh, each and every single one of the via one each and every single one of these units of course they exert a zone of control and if i kind of make this uh two tiled barrier right over here and these guys will be just kind of changed along, changed, chained along here. It'll be fairly difficult for any of the, the Russian troops to try to move back and across that area. Later on, what we'll see is that if I toggle, like, say, for example, the supply map mode here shortly, um, I believe it's this one. Yeah. Later on, we might see some of the, uh, some of the, some of the Russian troops being isolated. So that's one thing to note. So while we have that going on, um, we'll get the rest of the forces, a lot of the, me the mechanized forces and all, to make the drive forwards. So we've already have the, so yeah, we have one side of the barricade kind of set up over here. Another portion of it will race forwards. They're going to come over here and they will try to push as far as they can. They'll try to capture a lot of stuff there. I'm going to get them to clear out practically everything around these two tiles. So get them to shatter that unit. 
do a lot of damage over here. And currently we're going to ignore exactly how many losses they, they kind of uh, front, front out over here. Because it's not too relevant at the moment. I'm going to move the HQ up moderately. We're going to get the uh, the Mortarized Division to push back these ice, unisolated troops. The reason being is that they, do a, they take a, a lot of attrition when you kind of force a routed unit to flee even further. And then... With the rest of the, the, the Panzer Corps here, I'm only going to move them up a gradual amount because currently I don't necessarily need to uh, do all too much. Or you know what, I could go a bit farther. So we'll do something like that. And you know what, we'll push them back right here. Right. So we'll do something like that along the, uh, the main side of the flank. And now we're going to hop up here. The reason being is that with uh, the neon green colored units, this is also another tank core, and the idea being that I can kind of link up with my forces and ideally crush a large segment of the forces back over here. I'm going to send some units just beforehand to recon uh, Minsk, Minsk over here, see what's over there, and then kind of continue this push. So that'll be kind of exactly what we do here. Right, so we'll move up those units, get the infantry again to pluck a hole through the enemy's defenses. And this is really kind of what will be squeezing a lot of our forces through. Right, so we're going to make that hole. And now, I'll have to try to figure out what exactly we want to push through here immediately with. So let's see. We can, we can get this unit to clear up the rest of that, and it looks like that is the 5th Tanks Division over here is actually quite a heavy unit. We'll try to route it like that. And once that's cleared, I think what we'll do is uh, we'll get a lot of the uh, neon green units here to kind of cut right through. And hey, would you look at that, they can link up immediately with these forces, kind of instantly making a connection right there. So this is pretty good. This means that I believe a lot of these units right over here, they should be considered isolated for now. Though the one thing that I'm not too sure about is whether or not that takes an actual turn, like um, like whether or not that takes a turn for that to react with. So in the meantime, we're going to get, uh, or now that we have this pocket open, we're going to get a lot of vehicles to make the drive forwards over here. And I kind of want them to... Um, a move through here. I'm gonna get this to, to push back a lot of the people there. Check out whether or not there's any supplies inside this town, and since there's not, I'm gonna get them to move across here, push that unit back. And ideally we can get our mechanized core to kind of stockpile up. and be ready for the next leg of the advance. So when we're pushing these tank corps forces really, really deep into enemy territory, of course, the one of the things that we need to kind of check here is whether or not any of these towns here have supply available. So if they don't, then that's fine and all. But if they do, we would much prefer moving our, our units into those instead. And since they don't, we will get our forces to just kind of rest up over here. So that's one portion of the uh, the armored core. Now, the other portion is going to go forwards. And the idea being that I'm trying to set it up so that our forces are in decent shape. As in, they're not too, too far forwards. I want them to be in decent shape so that I can I can still kind of front supplies to them, destroy this pocket in the back a few turns in, and then push into what seems to be another pocket forming into Minsk uh, later on. So that's the general plan of things. Now let's see what can we do. Right, so I think I can move up the uh, the neon green HQ a little bit forwards, and over here, as we've seen in uh, previous videos, um, over here. 
we get to do the, the first leg up, if you will, to the uh, northern front as well. So we'll get these units to push, and we'll get them to make the uh, the move towards Kunas over here. This tile is, yep, it's usually defended with uh, quite a lot of forces, actually. So we'll, we'll stock up, and we will mount an assault there. Yeah, push through, hopefully be able to move into the tile. If not, then oh well. And there we go. So I shouldn't have moved this HQ that far forwards. And again, when you when you move your your HQs forwards, they they do take the the, the little bit to move those supply dumps. But in addition to that, I mean, if ideally we should be able to kind of pick up supplies from the rail yard, or yeah, from the rail yard instead of anything else. So with that said, our kind of our railway coverage stems from obviously parts of uh, of Königsberg over here which is ideally perfect because then we can kind of keep our HQ exactly there. Um, our units are still in range, so they shouldn't need that two-step uh, two process. Um, ultimately, it counts for a very small portion, but I mean, nevertheless, it's something to kind of take in, take in consideration. So we'll do something like that, and we'll get the rest of these forces moving. Now let's see whether or not we can push in through here. And would you look at that, we are. Perfect. So, um, these, these different campaigns kind of work out fairly differently, I would say, depending on how your, 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 your game kind of works out, uh, or, you know, the, the scale of the scenario. So inside the, uh, the the road to Leningrad one, um, this scenario here works out fairly differently as we've seen. Um, so just kind of bear that in mind here as we go along. So a lot of the forces here, I'm not going to check the reinforcement schedule, but they actually uh, they they pull back and they they help they support the northern drive. So later on inside the campaign, we don't get them. Um, so right now, I want to take kind of full advantage of that, and I just want them to really push forwards. Uh, but at the same time, you know, I recognize that they're not really kind of critical units. Uh, because for, for, the in for the intents of the game, they're kind of just removed and out uh, and done with, really. So with that said right now, this area will be fairly easy to clear up. And with the units that don't necessarily need to move, I think we'll just kind of keep them at the border, really. Taking a look at the HQs, I'm going to take a look at what units are kind of in supply, what are out. Still want to keep our units in supply, it's just that it's not, say, I, I would rather kind of keep them just at the edge of supply, rather than um, anything, anything kind of major. So with the tanks here, I have the opportunity to just kind of sweep through this area and clear up all of these pockets. So this is this is gonna be kind of the exception. The reason being is that this just causes so many losses for the enemy that it's all ultimately kind of worth our while to do. Now, of course, in the grand campaign, you kind of, uh, well, you get more options as to what exactly this does, right? So I think it's a bit better there. I'm gonna clear this pocket because then um, ideally, I think, yeah, I think we should be able to move our HQ right over here then or no, we'll move that back one tile. Yeah, that should... That should allow us to continue having supply to all these units, or so just kind of keeping the minimum range we need to be at uh, afloat. And now, the last portion of this is that I would really rather us being able to clear out that pocket right over there, but it doesn't look like we can. So I think we just bring these forces over here. And that's practically the end of our first turn. So taking a look at what we've done here is uh, we've split up a great deal of enemy troops from the uh, from the side of the map here. We made a pocket, 
And as we gradually kind of compress this, the, the enemy will realize that, uh, well, they're, they're trapped over here. They're not getting any supplies from um, all the way over to where their supply kind of originates. And if it can't trace that path, despite it perhaps having the supply point or a, 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 an amount of supplies built up inside here, um, they'll know that, say, for example, when I attack them, they'll, they'll, they'll start to kind of melt away and get destroyed, if you will. So my question here is that and I've never I've never found this out whether or not this happens immediately after you form the pocket or whether or not you need to wait a turn so if I take a look at say shattering that unit it appears back over here still inside the pocket it doesn't route outside the pocket which which makes sense but mind you I mean to to the best of my knowledge things happen simultaneously here and with that said um for example, yeah, sometimes it'll route and it'll appear back over here on the front, which to me says this isn't necessarily something that is fully isolated. So uh, I think we just keep pushing here. Try to crush this as small as we can. And then we just um, take out some of the very small portions of that. Try to shatter as many troops. And then just gradually kind of try to close uh, yeah, close this pocket with the remaining MPs here. So because I'm not terribly sure whether or not the pocket liquidation kind of happens right away, we're, we're currently doing uh, damage to say like some of the most fragile portions of the line, the ones that are typically going to shatter and break right away. Some of these units are surrendering. These are also surrendering. So I'm guessing pocket liquidation does indeed happen. Some of the units, mind you, they do make it out of the pocket just because, I mean, these aren't, these aren't, you know, you have like one guy kind of just watching the border all the way through. It, it's relatively loose. So a fair amount of the, the Russian troops did indeed manage to kind of break, break out of these areas and make it back to their lines. And the game does simulate the fact that some of their units do pull back uh, to in an, in an adequate kind of fashion. So that'll be that. Right, but for now, we'll get these guys to move forwards. And this is, um, you know, it's kind of another decision that you kind of have to make. Uh, so say, when you're breaking all of these forces, I mean, is it better to kind of wait for, for, for say, a better um, type of thing here? Or would you rather kind of have the infantry link up with the uh, mechanized forces sooner? So specifically over here, one of the things that you kind of have to deal with is the fact that as you push up forces, um, or, at, or rather as you kind of make these pockets, you, you got to commit to the time in uh, liquidating them. And when you when you start doing that, it's rather it's rather inefficient in the sense that as you as you move forwards here, you're going to take a lot of the infantry's time. And, you know, maybe it would be better if you could spend that infantry on, say, defending or defending what the tanks are, are kind of moving or something along the lines of that. So that's one of the things that you kind of have to um, t uh, take a look, look out for. For now, yeah, some of these infantry units stuck in swamps will be rather difficult to deal with. So that is, again, one of the things that you just kind of have to uh, look into. These three units we can recombine now that they are uh, where their purpose is fulfilled. And my plan here is mostly just to kind of get a get get our troops combined well enough that we can start moving them forwards as a solid front. Right, so it looks like that will be from the looks of it the end of the first turn. A lot of our forces have moved up and we should be ready for turn two. So, um, just to recap, and I think that'll be the end of the first video here, what we've done is that we've used the infantry the shot in the front, we've used the, the, the dark green one, and specifically the uh, the dark blue one here, to kind of isolate a pocket and destroy it. And in the meantime, I mean, we've chosen a few different paths for the tanks. Notably, here we've used them to set up a kind of a nice mesh screen. Again, it takes more time to move through different zones of control, and if you have your units kind of reasonably sp spread, spread out, it makes it a bit different, uh, or more different 
difficult rather for uh, your enemies to get through and then we've set the rest of the tanks to push forwards to try to crush whatever we have going earlier or going forwards and we've tried to set up the tanks so that they're nicely in the supply network so that next turn we can kind of do the same thing we'll be able to move on Minsk hopefully uh, surround it and uh, well crush some more units there so I think you so I think I'll see you guys later on another video uh, you know be sure to like and subscribe if you've enjoyed this scenario so far